a farming technique practiced for centuries by villagers in West Africa, which converts nutrient-poor rainforest soil into fertile farmland, could be the answer to mitigating climate change and revolutionizing farming across Africa. A global study by researchers has for the first time identified and analyzed rich fertile soils found in Liberia and Ghana. They discovered that the ancient West African method of adding charcoal and kitchen waste to highly weathered, nutrient-poor tropical soils can transform the land into enduringly fertile, carbon-rich black soils which the researchers dub African dark earths. Similar soils created by Amazonian people in pre-Columbian eras have recently been discovered in South America, but the techniques people use to create these soils are unknown. Moreover, the activities which led to the creation of these anthropogenic soils were largely disrupted after the European conquest. Encouragingly researchers in the West Africa study were able to live within communities as they created their fertile soils. To understand the final reason why the news marketplace of ideas dominated by television is so different from the one that emerged in the world dominated by the printing press, it is important to distinguish the quality of vividness experienced by television viewers from the vividness experienced by readers. I believe that the vividness experienced in the reading of words is automatically modulated by the constant activation of the reasoning centers of the brain that are used in the process of concreating the representation of reality the author has intended. By contrast, the visceral vividness portrayed on television has the capacity to trigger instinctual responses similar to those triggered by reality itself, and without being modulated by logic, reason, and reflective thought. The simulation of reality accomplished in the television medium is so astonishingly vivid and compelling compared with the representations of reality conveyed by printed words that it signifies much more than an incremental change in the way people consume information. Books also convey compelling and vivid representations of reality, of course, but the reader actively participates in the conjuring of the reality the book's author is attempting to depict. Until the early 1960s, newspapers published separate job listing for men and women. It wasn't until the passage of the Equal Pay Act on June 10, 1963 that it became illegal to pay women lower rates for the same job strictly on the basis of their sex. The wage gap is a statistical indicator often used as an index of the status of women's earnings relative to men's. It is expressed as a percentage, e.g., in 2005, Women earned 81% as much as men, and is calculated by dividing the median annual earnings for women by median annual earnings for men. Since 1963, when the Equal Pay Act was signed, the closing of the wage gap between men and women has been at a rate of about half a penny a year.
In a study in the current issue of the journal PLOS-1, a team of scientists in Germany showed experts and novices simple geometric objects and simple chess positions and asked the subjects to identify them. Reaction times were measured and brain activity was monitored using functional MRI scans. On the identification of the geometric objects, the subjects performed the same, showing that the chess experts had no special visualization skills. When the subjects were shown the chess positions, the experts identified them faster. Focusing on an element of an earlier study on pattern and object recognition by chess experts, the researchers had expected to see parts of the left hemispheres of the experts' brains, which are involved in object recognition, react more quickly than those of the novices when they performed the chess tasks. But the reaction times were the same. What set the experts apart was that parts of their right brain hemispheres, which are more involved in pattern recognition, also lit up with activity. The experts were processing the information in two places at once. The researchers also found that when the subjects were shown the chess diagrams, the novices looked directly at the pieces to recognize them, while the experts looked on the middle of the boards and took everything in with their peripheral vision. Most of the time when I embark on such an investigation, it quickly becomes clear that matters are much more complicated and ambiguous several shades grayer than I thought going in. Not this time. The deeper I delved into the confused and confusing thicket of nutritional science, sorting through the long-running fats versus carb wars, the fiber skirmishes and the raging dietary supplement debates, the simpler the picture gradually became. I learned that in fact, Science knows a lot less about nutrition than you would expect that in fact, nutrition science is, to put it charitably, a very young science. If still trying to figure out exactly what happens in your body when you sip a soda, or what is going on deep in the soul of a carrot to make it so good for you, or why in the world you have so many neurons, brain cells, in your stomach, of all places. It's a fascinating subject and someday the field may produce definitive answers to the nutritional questions that concern us, but, as nutritionists themselves will tell you, they're not there yet. Not even close. Nutrition science, which after all only got started less than 200 years ago, is today approximately where surgery was in the year 1650 very promising, and very interesting to watch, but are you ready to let them operate on you? I think I'll wait a while. One of Guinness World Records' more unusual awards was presented at the National Maritime Museum yesterday. After a 100-day trial, the timepiece known as Clock B, which had been sealed in a clear plastic box to prevent tampering, was officially declared, by Guinness, to be the world's most accurate mechanical clock with a pendulum swinging in free air. 
It was an intriguing enough award, but what is really astonishing is that the clock was designed more than 250 years ago by a man who was derided at the time for Lien incoherence and absurdity that was little short of the symptoms of insanity, and whose plans for the clock lay ignored for two centuries. The derision was poured on John Harrison, the British clockmaker whose marine chronometers had revolutionized seafaring in the 18th century, and who was the subject of longitude by Diva Sobel. His subsequent claim, that he would go on to make a pendulum timepiece that was accurate to within a second over a 100-day period, triggered widespread ridicule. The task was simply impossible, it was declared. But now the last laugh lies with Harrison. At a conference, Harrison decoded, Towards a perfect pendulum clock, held at Greenwich yesterday, observatory scientists revealed that a clock that had been built to the clockmaker's exact specifications had run for 100 days during official tests and had lost only five-eighths of a second in that period. It's important to realize that the brain doesn't see the world around it simply as though the scene was projected onto a cinema screen on the inside of your skull. Before a scene can be observed in your head, it has to be broken down into a number of different components for processing, and these components then have to be recombined into the meaningful form that we call an image. Amongst other things, the scene is broken down into its different colors, red, green and blue, in a way that's analogous to the manner in which a television image or magazine photograph is broken down into tiny dots of primary colors, which are too small to be noticed individually when we look at them, but which when seen collectively give the impression of a continuous full-color image. However, unlike in magazine images, the image that we see with our eyes is broken down not only into separate color components, but into other components too. It is, rather incredibly, deconstructed into component parts such as horizontal lines, vertical lines, circles and so on. Each of these component parts is sent to a separate area of the brain for processing, with the different components of the scene only merging again when they are unified into what you perceive as the image. With a good system of crop rotation, and especially with the addition of any sort of fertilizer you may be able to come up with, it's possible to grow crops on a plot of land for upwards of two to three years at a time with good results. Ultimately, though, you must let the land rest if you hope to continue farming there in the long run. Allowing a plot of land to rest for a period of time is known as letting the field go fallow, and there are several reasons for this. Allowing a field or plot to lie fallow means that you don't grow anything new on it, don't harvest anything and don't graze any animals on the land for at least a year. Sometimes a field will lay fallow for two, three, or even four years, but the traditional standard on many farms was to let a field lie fallow once every two to three years. 
This fallow period allows the land to replenish many of its nutrients. The root networks of various grasses or ground covers, like clover, have a chance to expand and grow, which further strengthens the soil and protects it from erosion. The 1920s moviegoers' experience was largely dominated by silent movies, but saw the introduction of synchronized sound. In the 1920s movie stars were really stars, with huge salaries, the fashions and activities of the Hollywood greats echoed around the world and 100,000 people would gather in cities all over the world, including such diverse cities as London and Moscow, to greet Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks when they toured of Europe. Early silent movies were often accompanied by live piano or organ music and provided enormous entertainment value to audiences captivated by the experience of watching moving pictures on the silver screen. Although there had been previous attempts to introduce sound, it wasn't until 1923 that a synchronized sound track was photographically recorded and printed onto the side of the strip of motion picture film and made it onto a commercially distributed movie. Delivering packages with drones will scale back CO2 emissions in bound circumstances as compared to truck deliveries, a brand new study from University of Washington Transportation Engineers finds. In a paper to be revealed an associate degree coming issue of Transportation Analysis Half D, researchers found that drones tend to own CO2 emissions blessings over trucks once the drones haven't got to fly terribly way to their destinations or once a delivery route has few recipients. Trucks, which may provide environmental edges by carrying everything from garments to appliances to the article of furniture in a very single trip, become a lot of climate-friendly various once a delivery route has several stops or is farther off from a central warehouse. For small, lightweight packages, a bottle of drugs, or a kid's bathing costume, drones contend particularly well. However, the carbon edges erode because the weight of a package increase since these unmanned aerial vehicles have to be compelled to use extra energy to remain aloft with a significant load.
By 1984, the Internet had grown to include 1,000 host computers. The National Science Foundation was one of the first outside institutions hoping to connect to this body of information. Other government, nonprofit, and educational institutions followed. Initial attempts to catalog this rapidly expanding system of networks were simple. Among the first was Archie, a list of FTP information created by Peter Deutsch at McGill University in Montreal. However, the greatest innovation in the Internet was still to come, brewing in an MIT laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The World Wide Web, or the Web, is often confused with the Internet. In fact, it is just one part of the Internet, along with email, video conferencing, and streaming audio channels. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee, now a scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, introduced a new system of communication on the Internet which used hyperlinks and a user-friendly graphical interface. His slice of the Internet pie camera to be known as the World Wide Web. Berners-Lee says, the web is an abstract, imaginary, space of information. On the net, you find computers, on the web, you find documents, sounds, videos, information. On the net, the connections are cables between computers, on the web, connections are hypertext links. According to Dr. Ron Fessenden, MD, MPH, the average American consumes more than 150 pounds of refined sugar, plus an additional 62 pounds of high fructose corn syrup every year. In comparison, we consume only around 1.3 pounds of honey per year on average in the U.S. According to new research, if you can switch out your intake of refined sugar and use pure raw honey instead, the health benefits can be enormous. What is raw honey? It's a pure, unfiltered, and unpasteurized sweetener made by bees from the nectar of flowers. Most of the honey consumed today is processed honey that's been heated and filtered since it was gathered from the hive. Unlike processed honey, raw honey does not get robbed of its incredible nutritional value and health powers. It can help with everything from low energy to sleep problems to seasonal allergies. Switching to raw honey may even help weight loss efforts when compared to diets containing sugar or high fructose corn syrup. I'm excited to tell you more about one of my all-time favorite natural sweeteners today.